I'm Cassidy Quinn, and this is Mentally Together. Because whether you can see it on the surface or not, we are all just trying to keep ourselves mentally together. And no matter what our brains are experiencing, we're not alone, we're together. Do you ever look at someone and think, wow, they are fearless? I feel like that word gets used a lot to describe people in the public eye, whether it's a professional athlete or a musician or anyone else you see as you scroll through Instagram. And obviously, to be fearless, you must have no fear. So that means those pro skiers dropping freaking cliffs aren't afraid of anything bad happening as they do it. Or those rock climbers hundreds of feet up in the air definitely are not afraid of falling off. Even just saying those things makes me feel fear. Fear is definitely something that lives inside me. Yet I have been told many times by various people that I am so fearless. When I used to host a TV show, I would try all kinds of random things on camera. Skydiving, eating bugs, holding a giant snake. And people would say, ooh, I am way too scared to do that. You must be fearless. But obviously those people couldn't see inside my brain to see that, yeah, there was definitely fear going on in there. Like when I went skydiving, I was absolutely terrified. As we rode up in the plane, we kept going higher and higher, and I kept thinking, wait, we're still going up? And then you want me to jump out of the plane to my death? <laughs> I mean, it was a possibility, right? But somehow, I just leaned into the fact that there was a very well-trained guide jumping with me, helping me do it, and also, I had just done the training, and I listened well, and therefore, hypothetically, I knew what I needed to do in order to do it. At least, I hoped so. And, you know, if I did end up dying, at least it would be a cool story, right? Anyway, clearly I lived to tell the story, but it wasn't without plenty of fear along the way. And I think that's true for all the stories we see in the world. I mean, sure, maybe there are a few people who actually have no fear but anyone that I've talked to that appears fearless on the outside, on the inside, actually does have some fear. They just know how to manage it, how to talk to it, and they know that it's not a bad thing. I mean, fear and anxiety have a purpose for us humans. We just have to learn how to listen to them. I'm not saying that I have figured out how to listen to my anxiety and fears in a productive way. I still have a tendency to overthink and my brain can totally freak out in a fearful moment. So, okay, I guess I should introduce you to someone who does know how to manage her fear. Someone who, if you've seen what she does, you probably think she's fearless. And yes, she is extremely brave and talented, but she does have fear just like the rest of us humans. It's Angel Collinson. Angel is a professional free skier. You may have seen her slashing steep spines on huge mountains in ski movies from Teton Gravity Research, or seen her in the Free Skiing World Tour, which she has won twice. She's won awards for her skiing on film, too, like when she was the first woman ever to win Best Line at the Powder Video Awards. When you watch her ski... And seriously, right now, you should pause this episode and go on YouTube, just search Angel Collinson, and watch a few of the ridiculous things she has done. But when you see her do that, you might think, like I did, she is freaking fearless. But turns out, she has fear. Plenty of it. But she is very close with her fear. She's lived in it so much that she knows how to listen to it and figure out what it's telling her. I loved talking to Angel about fear, anxiety, meditation, and how the heck we can listen to our gut. So let's get into it with, she's amazing, she's a free skier, she's a sailor now, she's a total badass, it's Angel Collinson. <laughs> Thank you for doing this. Thank you for being here. Uh, so psyched to be here. Thanks for having me on. Now, when I think of you, the first word I think of is always badass. And I know that is not the first time anyone said that to you because every time <laughs> I read something about you or listen to a podcast you're on, it always says like, she's a badass in every sense of the word, blah, blah, blah. Do you 
feel like a badass? Like, is that how you would describe yourself? <laughs> That's so funny that you said that because as you were saying the first word, I think I was like, what is the word going to be? And when you <laughs> said badass, I was like, oh, cool. Because I, I don't, yeah, I, um, I wouldn't say that's how I think of myself and it's, but it's always encouraging when you hear other people that think of you in these positive ways and you're like, Oh, cool. That's how people think of me. I guess I must be doing something of that sort. And so, yeah, that wasn't a very concise answer, but the, the, no. the short answer is like, not exactly. But then I remember that it's in there. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I mean, cause you obviously are very aware of the fact that like what people see of you is something that either you've put together on your Instagram or your own pages or an edit of a ski movie. And I'm sure there's like tons of moments where you might not feel like a badass that they cut out. And so then you see the oh, final yeah. cut and you're like, yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. Like yeah. Badass. Maybe like 5% of the time <laughs> you're like being a badass. And then the other 95% you're like, wait, do you guys think I should do this? Or how are you guys feeling about this today? You're like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> 95% waffling, 5% yeah. executing. <laughs> and I feel like some of that is starting to make its way into these ski movies, which I get super excited when I see yeah. parts where like, even when it's just the behind the scenes of a lot of times you're in a helicopter, but if you're like touring and you're hiking up and the struggles part of it and how it's yeah. actually hard work and not just the fun skiing down, which is also obviously very hard work. Um, but I like when you get to see like the struggles or the or the mental, I mean, that sounds kind of mean. Like I love to watch you guys struggle. <laughs> well, it's like the human side, like it, just exactly. with everything. I think it's almost like in the age of Zoom now, you know, it's like, oh my God, we're all over Zoom. But at the same time, it's like kind of cool when you get views into people's lives and it just, you see like the human aspects of all of us. And I think there's something in us where we just relish in seeing like the humanness in each other. You know, you're like, oh yeah, she has a dog that won't shut up either. Okay, cool. <laughs> or whatever right. the heck it is. I mean, even right now, like most of what I've seen of you is pictures or videos of you out on mountains in the snow or now on your sailboat and then getting to see this little glimpse of your little cozy nook in your house. It's exactly. Awesome. Yeah. So if people aren't watching the video version, you should check it out because you get to see a little behind the scenes look at Angel's life. <laughs> my little altar, my, I love my it. calming nook in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, before recently, the most I'd seen of you, everything I'd seen of you was those badass, intense moments, skiing some absolutely crazy shit I call <laughs> like, I've been snowboarding since I was eight years old and I like to think cool. like yeah I can go anywhere on the mountain but I could not go the places that you go on the mountain <laughs> but then I really started admiring you on another level when I started seeing you post about your struggles and your mental health moments and mm -hmm. the battles that you're going through what was mm -hmm. the process of you deciding to open up and kind of share about your vulnerabilities mm. That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I don't think I've ever been asked that one before. <laughs> I like it. Yes, I, we got yeah. it. <laughs> First timer. <laughs> you know, it's it's. I think it started really happening when, um, well, coming to grapple with the age of social media and yeah. being like, wow, everything that we put out into the world is a curated image. And there's all these expectations from sponsors or other people of like what your image should be, you know, but as an individual, you have to figure out like, A, what is your image going to be? What is your voice going to be? And like, how do you curate it? And to me, I was like, I really dislike social media in general. <laughs> and I realized that the only way that I could do it is if I was just putting out my genuine experience and what really was going on in the best way I could. And I do it, I don't do it perfectly, but I try. <laughs> and that's like my guiding principle is like, instead of what should I post, like, what do I actually want to say? And what's, a what's actually going on for me right now? And so that's, I've tried to keep that as my guidepost, but I really like the way that I came to that was when I was starting to gain a lot of um, notoriety with my ski career. And all of a sudden there was a lot more strange eyes on me and I felt all this Ooh. weird pressure and expectation. And then all of a sudden you like go through this weird, this weird phase, I guess, when you start to realize that a lot of people know who you are and you don't know who they are. And it's like a grappling of your ego. And you can see why I could see why some people who are famous um, seem really egotistical because it just messes with your psyche. Yeah. And so that was what I came to being like, okay, this is who I want to be in the world. And this is going to be my guiding principle. Do you ever, cause that has, I mean, your career, you ski, 
but then you have to get paid to ski. And it's not just like you get a salary, you get money every week in your bank account. Like you have to find sponsors. Right. And so I would think these sponsors, like, was that a hard thing to battle with when they start? You hope that there's no stigma, right? That these sponsors are like, yes, Angel can open up about her mental health and we can see that she struggles and that she is scared when she's skiing sometimes. And that is great. But was there any kind of I don't even know how to ask it the right way, but I like, I get nervous. Oh, if I say something sometimes a is too edgy, some sponsor yeah. in the future of the podcast going to be like, wait, what is that? Yeah. yeah. So what was that like? Well, it's always ongoing, you know, it's always <laughs> like, you, cause it's anytime you make, you make something, um, to the public, like a statement or anything that's vulnerable. Um, there's always so much that goes into it, you know, like, are you posturing, you know, are you like, there's all of these questions, you know, it, was it an overshare? Was it too much? Was it too personal? And we all have our own ways of grappling with that, but you know, it's like any, I know that I'm like doing something probably that will resonate with people when I'm like, Ooh, are my parents going to think this was a little too much? <laughs> Um, you know what I mean? It's like, yes, oh, I feel of, you on that. There's totally. like, there's like, like the edginess. My parents? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's sort of like my, my thing. Um, but I think to me, because they, they just represent the outside world, you know, and they've always encouraged me to be myself and to lead the life that I want to lead. So it's not like, um, I, I have strict parents or anything like that. It's just like, for yeah. whatever reason in my mind, that's like the the stop point of like, Ooh, how is this going to land? And well, they're like I, the outside world, but they're also the outside world that knows you and that will tell well, me. So can, yeah. 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 <laughs> but if it's like, Ooh, I don't know about that. And <laughs> there's been rare occasions where I've talked to my parents and about something really vulnerable and decided not to share it. Um, but those times are pretty few and far between. And mo I've almost always found that when I actually hang myself out there and say something that feels uncomfortable that my sponsors are usually almost always really supportive. Well, no, they always have been. Um, <laughs> but it, it, there's always that question of like, Ooh, are they going to not be stoked on this? But then in hindsight, they always are. And I think that really has been speaking to what I've been experiencing. And probably a lot of us have been experiencing in our lives right now, where you aren't sure if something is the right thing to do. And there's nothing that can really make that decision for you, except for like yourself and what you know to be right for you in your life. And you might not be super supported until you take those first couple steps and people are like, oh, hell yeah, that's awesome. That's sick. Like, you know, and, and then the support starts to come in. So it's like that, that brave process that we have to go through where like, we know what's right for us and we may not be totally supported in the moment, but we have to make the first couple steps and then the momentum follows and the support from people follow. Yeah. I always hear, I don't remember the exact quote, but like being brave, it might be Brené Brown. I don't know. I'm just probably mindlessly quoting here. It says, yeah, everything she, she says everything amazing. <laughs> um, but that like being brave in the moment doesn't feel good. No. And then it, once you yeah. do it and, and you give it time for it to do what it's supposed to do, then it's like, oh yeah, I was brave. That was good. But in the moment you're like, oh, this sucks. Yeah. Totally. It, I actually, I think of her a lot because like we know with skiing or with our sports that when we do something that requires us pushing our limits, we know that discomfort and we, uh, we're com we, we know it's coming. We lean into it. We're like, oh yeah, like this is how, you know, dropping a 20 foot cliff for the first time all, all season feels like it always sucks. You know, yeah. you're always like, Ooh. But when it comes to the things in life, you know, it's the same process. It's the same discomfort. It's like really similar fear, but Brene Brown has done a really great job of normalizing it and being like, yeah, doing new things is really uncomfortable. Being brave is really uncomfortable. It doesn't feel good. Like my favorite quote that she said <laughs> is everything meaningful that I've done in my life has been really uncomfortable. And I was Ooh. like, yeah. So I think about that. That just really... like gave me some chills. That was, yeah. That's a good one. I think about that a lot. When you started opening up, was there that response from people on social media? Like, did you immediately see, oh, wow, this is resonating with people and clearly more people are relating to this than maybe you expected? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, at least in my experience, it's been really immediate. It, I don't think I've ever gotten a negative response when I'm coming from the right place. And I think we all know there's like 
two ways to be vulnerable, or I don't know, maybe there's more, but in my brain, <laughs> there's, there's two that I usually can go under. And one is like being vulnerable about, but you're like still stuck in the struggle, but you're in, um, a disempowered place and the vulnerability feels like, um, like a searching for like an energetic searching or a pulling in, like you're trying to get something by being vulnerable because you're feeling compromised. And whenever I'm coming from that place, the things that I'm looking for never come in, right? When I'm coming from a vulnerable place where I'm not looking for anyone to solve my problems, I'm not necessarily looking for them to be fixed, but I'm just existing in them and I'm sharing my existence in them. It with a air of maybe humor or humility or whatever, <laughs> or maybe a little bit of griping. That's always when I get the best responses. So it's like, it's just about coming from, yeah, from the right place. If you're, if I'm going to share something risky and every time I come from that place, it's immediate when people are like, oh my gosh, same, I've been feeling the same. And it's, <laughs> it's really cool. It's so encouraging. We're like, right. We're all just little human beings, like wandering around <laughs> trying to figure out what the heck is going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. sounds like, cause I think about this a lot of a lot of times what I think in my brain is that if I'm going to share something, like make a video about it or talk about my own mental health, like I have to have it figured out. Like, oh, well, I better have the answers so I can tell you what you should do and you'll right. feel amazing. And right. really, no, like the point is the process. Life is the process. And and if you share that, that's what people relate to instead of just like, well, I figured it. I mean, pe- there are people that have it figured out and I love their advice too, but that's yeah. not where I am. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like the, it's the process of when you're talking to a friend about something that you're struggling with and you say this whole thing and there's like two different responses that they can have. One is like, oh man, well, you know, it would really help with that. Blah, 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 blah. And a list of like all these other ways that you should be living your vice and it's full of advice. And maybe some of the advice is really good, but what yeah. maybe what you're hoping for is the second or other <laughs> type of response, which is like, Oh man, that's kind of rough, huh? And I feel that for you. And like just that moment of like acknowledgement and relating can be so profoundly helpful in just helping you shift out of it. You're like, oh, cool. I just needed somebody to like get what I was going through. And then you can just move through it on your own. But sometimes, man, I can just be. I think relationships, like especially male, female relationships are really great for this because guys love to fix, you know, and my boyfriend (laughs) is really actually good at just listening and being like, "Mm, ah, (laughs) man, that sounds awful. Or like, wow, I'm so proud of you, blah, blah. And then not offering a solution. And I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. Okay, let's let's move on to the next thing. If I want a solution, I will ask you for a solution, but I kind of just want to talk about it and say my feelings and maybe like cry and and hug you maybe. Yeah, totally. (laughs) And it's like the same thing on social media. I think like there's a lot of people, I think it's normal for us all to feel like well, everybody else has it figured out. So I better have it figured out. And if I'm going to talk on something, I better not talk on it unless I know what I'm talking about, which means I already have it figured out. Right. And, but then that just comes off as like being preachy or advicey. Right. Like, or you, or then you're waiting too long to share something that right. then by the time you like have it figured out, you, for me, sometimes I forget what that moment in the middle was even like. Like if I have a total like horrible mental day and I'm feeling super depressed and then a few days later, I'm like, you know, I should write a a post about how I had a bad day, but I'm like, I don't even remember now because now I'm feeling good. So that day's gone. And so if you just do it in the moment, then yeah, I feel that for sure. Yeah, Is that uh, with your relationships with the people you ski with, like with your, I'm sure their friends and colleagues all combined, do you guys now, or maybe you always have opened up about you know, when you're out in the helicopter, maybe, and you're getting ready to land and then ski down eventually, do you guys talk about struggles and, oh, I'm having a bad day or, yeah. 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 I feel like I've been really, uh, I guess you could say blessed or fortunate to be with the teams that I've been working with because they've been with just these amazing experienced men, like veterans and women too. Um, but you know, primarily I've worked with men and, Mm -hmm it's like so important skiing to me is like a bubble and sports are a bubble that where we, it's just like a microcosm of like life in general. Right. So I find skiing really metaphorical in my life. And, you know, when we're working as a team out in the mountains, 
it's really important that we all know where each other's at and where we might be compromised in our decision making or mm. just like you you operate as a team differently depending on everyone's like mental and emotional states and so as a team like you know sometimes people don't talk about what's going on in great detail but in general we have a pretty good idea of like what everyone's going through where they're at and and my best mentors have been like, yeah, I'm not feeling it today. Or, yeah, I'm having an off day or whatever. And I've learned so much from being able to be like, yeah, today's just not my day. <laughs> and having people be like, good. Hell yeah. <laughs> like eat another Snickers. <laughs> Does your plan then change on those days? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes you set out and this is where meditation has helped me just like find my center every day a little bit better. Cause sometimes you, you have these grand plans for the day and you're like, I'm going to ski the gnarliest blah, blah. And you wake up, maybe you're feeling a little off. Maybe you just couldn't focus in meditation. You're like, Hmm, okay. I feel a little weird. And then you get out there and maybe your body's are extra tired or, you know, and especially if there's, if you had a fight with your boyfriend the night before, or mm -hmm. maybe you're battling a cold and, you know, there's all these factors that go into it and being able to be like, oh yeah, today is one of those days and being able to change your decision is, or how are you going to go about the day is like, it'll save your life. It's so yeah. important. Yeah. Yeah. It'll totally save your life. Which, yeah. Like sometimes, you know, a lot of times we can be like, oh, it's not life or death. No, but it, it is. In but that it case. is. But yeah. 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 So it's, and I mean, it's just a really great tool to have. Like, I, I mean, like I was saying in life in general, to be able to be like, well, this is the way that I was trying to go, but now things aren't looking quite <laughs> like the, you know, the pandemic is a great example of that. Like, okay, right. time to readjust. Mm -hmm. When people see, or at least I'll speak from my experience, when I see you ski these crazy lines and see the, the final product of the ski movie, of course, my first instinct is, wow, Angel must be freaking fearless because that looks terrifying. But then I've heard you talk about, no, that's not it at all. It's that you have a very close relationship with your fear. Mm -hmm. uh, so w yeah. How, how do you describe that? Yeah. It's um, well, I think my favorite way to describe my relationship with fear is, but it's a quote by Pema Chodron, who's a Buddhist nun. And it's this, this is the quote. Most people think that brave people have no fear. And the truth is that they're intimate with it. Mm -hmm. And that when I heard that, it just like gave words for my experience. And it's like all of us up there are puckered. I mean, on the days when we like just which is super, just a great verb on a side note. <laughs> <laughs> totally puckered. And uh, you know, on the serious days out there, like we're talking a lot less. You know, everyone's sort of in their zone, it's much quieter the vibe is very serious and you just know, even if you're not saying that you're all nervous, it's like, we all know the internal experience that we're having. And, but with, on that same note, everyone deals with it differently. And I think also men and women deal with it quite differently. Yeah. And my experience is, I believe that for me, I have two kinds of fear. And one is like a nervous energy that's always there whenever you're pushing your edges, you know, whenever you're about to ski something that is challenging or if there's consequence, you know, and it it's the attunement of your nervous system and your entire body to be engaged and be fully present and be on. And that's helpful. We need that. Yeah. And then there's another kind of fear that's like deeper and it's harder to distinguish from the nervous energy. And that's like a sort of gut instinct that can be saying no. And when that kind of fear is present, that's where it's time for a big plan change or, or to listen, you know, and it, at first I couldn't distinguish very well between the two. And then based on trial and error, when I made some mistakes, I'm like, oh, that was that feeling that was trying to, that was my instinct trying to tell me, oh my gosh. no, no, not the day, not the line, whatever. And so it's like the more intimate I am with it and the more I accept it, the easier I can listen to what it's trying to tell me. And I don't shut it out. I'm just like, yeah, cool. I'm scared. And that's that. <laughs> what do you go through in your mind in those moments when you realize, okay, maybe it's not the kind of fear that means you need to back away. You're just scared in the moment and you can go through it. Uh, what, what do you go through in your brain? 
Um, that's also a really great question. <laughs> I think we all have our different tools to sort of manage that kind of fear. And um, so I like deep breaths a lot. I mean, it's pretty simple, right? But usually the most effective techniques are pretty simple, especially yeah. when you're dealing with fear. So I like deep breaths, but also what's really helpful for me is um, to just focus on the next thing that I'm doing. Maybe it's buckling my boots. Maybe it's adjusting my helmet instead of thinking of the whole line and everything that's going to go down and where's Sage and where's Ian and are they ready? And are the camera guys set up and do I have five minutes or do I have two minutes or like, do I really know where I'm going? Like there's so much that we can be thinking of that just like riles me up. And if I'm just like, it's cool. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> like, I know that I'm nervous and I'm just going to go a little slower and I'm just going to like, and, but it's just focusing your awareness on like one thing and then the next thing and then the next thing. Cause that's all you can really do anyways, you know, totally just about everything at once. Yeah. If you need a reminder to go outside today, here it is. Sometimes that is exactly what my brain needs. Some fresh air, some vitamin D, and my favorite place to do that is in the mountains, on my snowboard, away from most other humans. And that is where True Gear comes in. True, T-R-E-W, outerwear is designed to make your experience in the backcountry more enjoyable. It's weatherproof and so well thought out, like the integrated avalanche transceiver pocket and the women's drop seat, keeping you comfortable for a long day outside. Plus, True believes that people who have positive experiences in the mountains are better stewards of the environment, happier people in their communities, and more motivated to make the world a better place. I've been wearing their chariot bib for a few ski seasons now, and oh my goodness, it is life-changing. Yes, I know it is just an article of clothing, but guys, there is a zipper on the bum that allows you to go to the bathroom. Is that TMI? I'm just being honest, okay? I love these bibs. <laughs> if you and your brain want to have a great time in the mountains, go get yourself some bibs or a jacket or all of the above. Use the code BACKCOUNTRYBRAINS for $25 off any order over 100 bucks and free shipping. Just go to truegear.com. That's T R E W G E A R.com for $25 off with the code BACKCOUNTRYBRAINS, all one word. And then have fun outside. Have you been putting off a visit to the doctor for way too long? Yeah, I do that too. And when I finally do call and make an appointment, the doctor's office usually tells me the next available appointment is months away. That's why I've started going to ZoomCare. With locations in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Colorado, ZoomCare offers same-day doctor visits that you can book online or from their app. Yep, you don't have to talk to anyone on the phone. They even offer mental health visits, where you can speak to a board-certified mental health provider in person or through video. ZoomCare is where I went last year for my ADHD diagnosis, and they made the process so simple. They really took away my stress. So if you're ready to make an appointment of your own, head to ZoomCare.com. That's ZoomCare, Z-O-O-M-C-A-R-E.com. Now, back to the show. I've also heard you talk a lot about listening to your gut, and obviously that's part of what we've been talking about this whole time. How do you... Like, how do you, sometimes I feel like I'm good at that. And sometimes it's really difficult to figure out, okay, is this my gut or is this my, the anxiety demons or whatever, or like, where is this coming from? How do you figure out what's, what is in the gut? Oh my God. <laughs> what is in the gut? <laughs> what, what in the gut? <laughs> That's exactly what came to my mind. I was like, That's a weird reference. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what is in the gut? That is really, that's like the question of humanity. I think it's yeah. so hard to listen to your intuition and to figure out when it's talking, when nervous energy is talking. And I think the two things that have been the, I feel like I've been throwing out number two a lot on this <laughs> podcast. The Angels two things. Top two for everything <laughs> in life. You can have a book that's like your top two of, of all these different things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've narrowed it down to two for all you yeah. listeners. <laughs> I think number one is trial and error. Like we just, we learn by trial and error. Like you have to know what doesn't work or what it wasn't saying, or, you know, like you, you learn by making mistakes. And I, for me, my intuition 
has, uh, that's probably been my most helpful lessons have been when I've made mistakes and I've been like, Oh, that was what I was trying to tell me. And the next time I'm in that situation, I'm like, Oh, there's something in me. That's like, ding, ding. This feels kind of familiar. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I remember how that went last time. And I, (laughs) didn't do the correct thing. So I'm going to do the other thing this time. And, and I fell down a thousand feet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've seen Oopsies. that video. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah, so it's really subtle. Um, but I mean, not being afraid of trial and error, I think is like the biggest thing. And the other big thing is doing little things that build trust in yourself because from my experience, my intuition is, can feel pretty quiet and it gets quieter when you override it, even with everything, it can be in a relationship or it can be (laughs) like with whatever, with your family, like you name it. If there's something where you're like, I kind of need this thing. And you're like, no, sorry, no chance that's (laughs) happening today. And your intuition actually gets quieter. Or if your body's like, I need a rest. And you're like, sorry, got to keep plugging on. So the more that I listen to what I need to do for myself and act on it, the clearer the signals come through. So it's like, it's really awesome because it's totally in our hands and we can, I mean, it's not easy to do, but the more that I do the things that I know I need to be doing, or even if it's really subtly, I feel like I need to be doing, my Mm -hmm. intuition has gotten so much better. It's really cool. (laughs) That's really awesome. Okay. There's hope. There's hope for me and my intuition and my gut. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Yeah. You mentioned like stepping back and taking a rest. Is that yeah. something that you do? Oh often? my gosh, yes. Like, are you good yes. at good this at year? Doing that? This oh, year has yeah. been learn how to rest year. Um, I, my family wasn't a rest family. They were like very active, go do all the things, hike all the mountains, do the outside <laughs> stuff all day, every day. One of my dad's mottos was sleep when you're dead. So, <laughs> my yeah. dad went to college, he said, okay, you're not going to have time to do everything. You're going to want to sleep, eat, do your homework, have fun with your friends. One of them has to go and it's going to be sleep. <laughs> yeah. And then now I'm like, okay, I appreciated that dad, but also I need sleep but, or my yeah. brain doesn't work. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's really actually interesting. All of the things that are coming in, especially uh, I've been following this neuroscientist, uh, Andrew Huberman. Huberman Labs on Instagram, I believe is the handle, and he does really great chats, but he talks a lot about neuroplasticity and, you know, the idea that we can totally rewire our brains and form basically new circuitry. And it's so important that in order, like the, we rewire our brains by having, um, periods of intense focus and periods of intense rest. And if we don't get the period of intense rest for our brain, which means not scrolling on Instagram, that's not restful, like nope. not watching TV, right? You're not, you're not intaking a lot of information through your brain. And those periods of intense rest are what, call, and it's the same with, you know, working out, they're showing how like rest is more impactful than working out because if you don't recover properly, you don't actually build strength. So there's all this stuff coming out right now about just how important rest and sleep are. And that was really showing up in my life too. And I was just like freaking slave driving myself into the ground at first, this quarantine when I'm like, I can do all the things. I think a lot of us had this experience. I can do all the things. I have so many new hobbies. I know I'm going to do it all. And then I just realized while well, I was working with my Ayurvedic teacher and she was like, okay, Angel, here's the deal around noon or after you eat lunch, you have to lay down for 20 minutes. You don't have to fall asleep, but you can't look at a screen and you just have to do nothing for 20 minutes and lay down. And I was like, grumble, grumble, grumble. But, um, with what I was going through, I was like willing to try it. And at first I was like feeling so bad about myself. Like, Oh, I'm so lazy or I could be doing this stuff or this is so unproductive. That was a huge thing. This is so unproductive. Mm -hmm. And then I started really looking forward to it. And then I started to like do it on my own after the prescribed amount of time was over. And I really had to think of rest differently, especially as an athlete, you know, it's like we pride ourselves on our ability to go and to handle and to do. And our society is really focused on productivity. But what we don't see is like, if we rest more, we're actually so much more focused and productive, but we have all of this like stigma or many of us have all this stigma around not resting. So yeah, I really had to face that head on and I can tell anyone who's listening, it is (laughs) so worth it. And now I like take some time to just lay down, even if it's five or 10 minutes and I put my feet up on a pillow and I just chill and it's the best ever. And I'm so much more productive because of it. 
So is that yeah. like what your periods of rest entail is literally just laying down doing absolutely nothing? Or do you like, you know, draw or paint or I don't know, go on a walk? Like what is your, yeah. what is your rest period? Um, well, I've started incorporating like total rest days where I don't like if I can, in my best ones are when I turn off my phone and when I turn off my computer and man, always the best. Um, sometimes I'll go on walks. Sometimes I'll literally just lay on the couch or in my bed and read all day, like all day if I need it, you know? I've been noticing yeah. I actually need those days more than I was willing to admit before. Right. And yeah, so it's like, it kind of depends on where I'm at, but sometimes I need to like totally not even be up, sitting up at all, all day. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds so lovely. <laughs> yeah. It's but like getting ourselves to make the time for it is really hard. Like we're not, it goes against so much. And I just encourage anyone who's listening. That's like, I've been thinking about doing it. Do it. <laughs> it's worth it. <laughs> what do you do on a day where maybe it is that you need rest, but you just wake up and you feel super anxious or sad or bad about yourself? Um, like what, what do you do on those days as far as self-care? Yeah. Um, well, sometimes to me, self-care looks like doing less. It looks like taking less. You know, sometimes we're like, oh gosh, I'm feeling awful. Like I need to take a bath and I need to like maybe take some stuff off my to-do list that's been weighing on me. And may like all of those things are great and sometimes super helpful. But often when I'm anxious and I think I need to do more, um, doing less is actually what I try and do. So it's like, I maybe just focus on two things on the to-do list and then two I allow again. My- just two. <laughs> there we go. What the heck? I didn't even try that time. I haven't tried any of the times because sometimes, you know, I'm sure anyone who struggles with anxiety has felt this where you wake up and you're like immediately your eyes open and the Rolodex of all the things that you should be worrying about start oh, yeah. going, you know, and you're like, okay, I, I, I don't have time to meditate. I don't have time. To, and then you're like, no, no, I should meditate. I know it's good for me. And then you like force yourself to sit on the mat and then the Rolodex is still going. And then you're like, right, focus on the breath, focus on the breath. <laughs> and then you're like, God, I'm really sucking at this right now. Oh man. Then you just like go into the self-shaming. Could you jump inside struggle. my brain and read my thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's like the human experience. But yeah. so I did this um, Vipassana, which is a 10 day silent mm-hmm. retreat uh, last year about a year ago in December. It was really cool. It was, it was really hard. And, and they, what the teachers said that I thought was really funny is they're like, this is a peak experience of doubt is when you're sitting, you're trying to meditate and all you can think about is all the ways that you're second guessing yourself and you're really like struggling. And, and they're like, if you can catch yourself and think or, or catch the thought and be like, Oh, wow. Yeah. This is, I'm just experiencing doubt right now. They're like, that's a peak doubt experience. That counts as like a plus gold star. You just (laughs) saw it for what it was. And that's all you can do is just like see things for what they are. Cause a lot of times you can't think your way out of them. They they're going to pass through. Sometimes they arrive and sometimes they leave. And sometimes we have no control over when they come or when they go and being able to recognize like, Oh, right. I'm just having one of these experiences and it's okay. And it's going to pass. That's sometimes the only thing we can do. So I wish I had a better answer for it, but when I am at my best, I just realize that I'm having a shitty day and I just do focus on the next thing and then the next thing. And I don't try to do too much and Mm -hmm. I know it's going to pass. And some, you know, reaching out and connecting with somebody is always so helpful or usually, you know, but then there's times when you don't feel like that and that's okay too. But yeah, just or you like don't allowing. feel sometimes for me, like I don't feel like that. And then I make myself like, Oh, I'm going to call my mom. And then at the end I'm like, okay, yes, that helped. Fine. Fine. Yeah. Okay, it was yeah. good. I just didn't want to talk to anyone. But yeah. Yeah, totally. I would definitely say like, Oh man, I, my go-to is isolating for sure. I'm like, this, this is all going to be fine. I got this. It's just going to be <laughs> over. And then, you know, whatever. And, but every time when I reach out and connect it, I'm always glad that I did. I love that you talk a lot about meditating. I started meditating like a year ago and it has been so helpful for my brain, but I go through so many of those days where 
you at least push. I, I get a lot of mornings. I'm like, yeah, I have to do something right now. And this is my to-do list. So oh, meditating's right. out the window. So lately I've gotten very bad at actually implementing the practice, but I know that it works. I know that it works as far as like rewiring my brain, making me feel less anxious and be able to, yeah, notice that self-doubt when it pops up and, and push those thoughts away, um, make them leave, like you said. Um, but a lot of people I talk to are like, oh, I could never meditate. I can't do that, which is yeah. what I thought because- yeah you say silent retreat, my brain's like, I don't know if I'm physically capable of not talking for that long. Um, but meditating, like if I can do it, I think anyone could do it. How, how, why has it been so helpful to you? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I mean, I was in that boat too. Um, but now I've been successfully doing it pretty regularly since I was 20. Um, but for, you know, my entire teenage years, I was like, nah, that's not for me. Yeah. And, um, and like so many people that I talk to are like, you know, I just, I can't stop the thoughts and I just want any, like, that's the whole practice and the whole point. It's not to stop your thoughts because they're always going to come. It's just to, to notice them. And like, it's a constant refocusing for me where, well, there's different types of meditation, but actually I'm going to just jump off of this tangent and go total non sequitur, not really, but to anyone who, and how I, what was really helpful for me starting is again, two things. Are you ready for it? <laughs> One is um, to use an app. It's really yes. helpful to have a little bit of guidance and there's a lot of great ones out there. And if, if it's been like tickling your intuition or your little something's like, you know, I really want to try it. I really would recommend an app. It's super helpful. And um, Headspace, 10% uh, Happier, um, Waking Up by Sam Harris is probably my, my favorite. I really like that one. Ooh, uh, I haven't tried calm. that one. I'm a big fan of the calm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's lots of great ones. I highly recommend them all. And then the other thing I would say, and what actually got me to start meditating was to not try and sit for five minutes because even when, even now when I'm busy, five minutes sounds like a lot. And so what I'll do is I'll just do three breaths and it doesn't even have to be at my altar. It doesn't have to be in a specific location. It might be right before you drink your coffee or something that you do every time in the morning, but to just start with it so simple that you can't not do it. Like so easy. <laughs> Maybe it's one breath where you're just like, yeah. okay, I'm just going to take a really calming, grounding breath. And I'm just going to think in and I'm just going to think out. And then call it. That's it. That's your meditation practice for the day. And just try and do that for a week and see how you feel. Maybe you're like, oh no, I can, I'm going to do two breaths. I'm going to do three breaths. And if you go to four breaths and you're like, nah, I can't quite do that. I'm, I'm not, I don't have time for that this morning. Then go back to three or go back to one. You know what I mean? So yep. starting with it uh, and I have to do it all the time is adjust, adjust it to make it easier. Um, it's kind of I'm like, you know, you have, there's apps for, if you want to like start running and you want to run a 5k, they don't say like run 5k today. It's like, okay, first we're going to run for one minute and then we're going to walk for a minute and then we're right. going to run for two minutes tomorrow. And then we're going to walk for two minutes. And so we, it makes so much sense with these physical things, but yeah. it also is works applies for mental things also. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And there's like a whole stigma around meditation where we think it's supposed to be a certain way, but we don't really know how to do it. We don't really know exactly what it's supposed to be. And so like, I totally get that. I was totally in that boat. <laughs> and I really think that, you know, there's certain types of meditation that you hear about, like mindfulness meditation, where you're focusing on, you know, your breath or sounds or whatever. But I really think it's uh, the way that I, the way that I was also taught is like, it's just a time where you get to sit with yourself. And like, just allow three breaths of just like sitting with yourself and every meditation practice is different. And it's just like, whatever you want to make it, it can be, you know, it can be envisioning your future in a really great way that you can't wait for it to look like, or whatever. It can be different. It doesn't have to be this regimented thing. And I would encourage anyone listening who's thinking about starting to just make it what you want, what make it what sounds fun. Cause that's what it's all about. Yeah, totally. It can be fun. And yeah. It doesn't have to, like you said, the word practice, like it is a practice. It's not that you're supposed to just be perfect at it. That's not the point. Oh yeah, at all. totally. Yeah. It's like, and for me, it's like a time where I get to allow myself to be imperfect. Like sometimes I'll sit down and I'm expecting to like 
get all perfectly zen <laughs> and I'm on my mat and like my back hurts or I'm uncomfortable or I'm hungry. And sometimes I just allow myself to get up and leave and be like, okay, yeah, just wasn't working for me today. And the less I force myself to do things, the more likely I am to actually like build a lasting yeah. habit, you know, <laughs> or to be like, okay, I'm just going to take two breaths and then I'm going to go. Yeah. Yep. That's all. I like that. I like that you can yeah. just start small. I had never thought of that as just like, okay, three breaths. That can be, that's a meditation for it today. It could be one. Yeah. Right. yeah totally. I love that. I always have time mm-hmm. for one breath. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. have to. <laughs> yeah. Now people might be listening and thinking, wow, Angel knows a lot about mental health and meditation and wellness and all these things. Like she should do this for her job too. Well, <laughs> you're starting a business for that, right? <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah, Congratulations, um, by the thanks. way. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. It's, I'm really excited. It's funny. You know, I like, I don't want to market it super hard because I hate when people, I hate when I feel like things are getting pushed really hard in my face. So um, without trying to market for it right now, basically like the reason why I'm starting it is because what's helped me more in my skiing and in my life and listening to my intuition more than anything else has been practicing Ayurveda, which is, uh, well, and it's, it's been a particular program that I was taught. I learned it through my teacher and it sort of it combines behavioral science, which we've kind of been hitting on a little bit and, uh, Ayurvedic wisdom. And it's like a 12 week course. So you can either like, basically I'll be running people through this program, this 12 week program, or they can sign up and run through it three times with me over the course of a year. But the idea is like, I have experienced firsthand how much having better daily habits has helped me in all of these different areas in my life. And like having specific guidelines that are, you know, two to 5,000 years old that are like time tested, (laughs) it has been so profound that I'm like, as times have been changing and going crazy and we're all like struggling to find ourselves and our bodies and our meaning. And, you know, it's helped me the most with my mental health. Like, I just, that's what I want to share. So I'm getting certified to, yeah, basically teach this 12 week program. And that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's really awesome. So it's not going to be for everyone. Um, but it's like, what I found is when we're really struggling with something or when we're really ready to change, having a group that an, an individual that's like helping you through it and keeping you accountable has been like, a game changer for me. And that's what part of this is, is like just creating communities where we're like, okay, we're ready to work on this stuff. And like, we're committed and eating earlier dinners is hard, but we're all doing it together. And (laughs) the combination of like ancient practices and like behavioral science and understanding how to effectively implement new habits is been so helpful. And that's just what I want to share. So thanks for letting me do my spiel. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I'm just so excited to like work with people in that space. If you're loving this episode of Mentally Together, you might be curious, what goes on behind the scenes? Which parts of the conversation were left on the cutting room floor? Well, let's talk about it over on Patreon. My patrons get to see deleted video clips from every episode and get to be the first to ask questions of each podcast guest, like from this episode. Clearly, I really enjoyed talking to Angel about skiing and anxiety and my experiences with both. So I had to tell her about a specific personal moment my anxiety kicked in in the mountains recently. So if you want to hear that and hear her extra piece of advice for me, it's on Patreon. Oh, and as one of my patrons, you get every episode of the show a day early on Sundays. You can read all about the different tiers and sign up at patreon.com slash Cassidy Quinn. Again, that's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Cassidy Quinn. Okay, so now I have a couple questions from our friends on the internet. (laughs) All right. Emily on Patreon wants to know if you have any self-care or adventure books or podcasts that you would recommend for people. Hmm. Yeah, great question. I'm having to think about that. (laughs) Um, All of them. All the things that I can't summarize into two things this time. Right. You can um, just you can just pick your top two. <laughs> pick my top two. Well, gosh, I just I every time I listen to or read Brene Brown's books, mm-hmm. her podcast is really great, or any podcast that she's featured on, also, she just has a really um down-to-earth approach for living life. And I guess um something is coming up right now. So I'm just going to say it, but (laughs) she talks about 
uh, this experience that we all experience called an FFT, which is a fucking first time or a freaking (laughs) first time. And I was, as I was getting ready to launch my business, I was like struggling. I had all this self doubt and I was super anxious. I was really like emotional this day. And I was talking to my boyfriend. I was just like, Oh God, I just like, it's so, I don't know what to do. And I don't know the next steps to take. And then all of a sudden I was like, Brene, she just spoke to me. I'm having an FFT. And then she has all these steps of like, if you're doing something for the first time, it's going to feel hard. And here's the five steps to take, you know, and it's like, like normal, name it, say you're having a freaking first time. It's really hard. Normalize it. This is how it's supposed to feel. Doing new things is uncomfortable, blah, blah. Anyway, she like has all of these really great self-care tips and like steps for processes. And anytime I hear her stuff, I'm like, Oh, right. This is how I can move through life. So I would say any of her books, I really recommend. Jackie wants to know, I'd love to know her thoughts on keep up culture, how she feels slash thinks about herself or women keeping up with the boys or keeping up with what sponsors want, et cetera, balanced with your intuition of what is safe or healthy or right for you. Mm -hmm. And she added that, like, she says, I feel like I've lived in a space where I was constantly pushing myself to keep up and then getting injured and discouraged and I'd beat Mm -hmm. myself up for it. But Mm -hmm. Angel keeps up and rips hard, but also seems to be so mindful of what is good or right for her and pushing herself when appropriate. Mm. Thanks, Jackie. It kind of goes back to when I was talking about managing my anxiety, both like in life and in the mountains. I call BS on keep up culture. I think that (laughs) like Jackie mentioned, it really often leads to us overriding, listening to ourselves and often leads to injury or burnout or lots of usually negative things. And I think part of the reason that I've had success is because I guess two things. I I'm quite calculated and I don't push myself beyond what I know I can do in fear of mm-hmm. keeping up. And like, I, I guess it, it just ties into what I was saying before. Like when I'm out with the boys, I push myself when I feel inspired. And if I don't feel inspired, I don't push myself. And when you listen to yourself and people can tell that you're listening to yourself, you actually gain a tremendous amount of respect. Like All of the men that I work with have a lot of respect for me because they know that I listen to myself and because they know that I respect myself, they, they respect me and they have so much support and encouragement. And it's like that same balance of like, if you're not overriding yourself and you're listening to yourself, chances are like maybe two out of three days, you're going to feel like backing down or maybe four out of five days, you're going to go there and be like, yeah, I'm not feeling it. I'm going to turn down or yeah, I'm not feeling it. But on that fifth day, you're going to feel freaking great and maybe feel like skiing something way harder than you would have if you were trying to push through every single day. So it's like, it's always a dance It's and it's always um, has to be started with the foundation of just allowing yourself to do whatever it is that you feel like you want to do. And your progression, it's sort of like resting, you know, you're, you'll be more productive or your progression will happen much quicker if you allow yourself the time to not push. So did that, do you think that answered the question? Yeah, enough? totally. Okay. Yeah. okay. Last but not least, I have a quick round of questions for you. <laughs> Let's do it. When was the last time you cried? Two days ago, I was like suffering extreme self-doubt with the whole launching my own business. And like, do I even know what I'm talking about? Am I taking on more than I can handle? All of the freaking things that you deal with, with making life changes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. The imposter syndrome is a real thing. <laughs> Yeah. What are you grateful for right now? Being able to talk to you about this. Oh, thanks. Me too. I'm very grateful for this. What is your best habit for your mental health that you do? Going easier on myself. Ooh. What about your worst habit for your mental health that maybe you need to stop doing? <laughs> yeah, being too hard on myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, I'm just going to interject one quick thing <laughs> that my boyfriend does for me that's really helpful is I will be out sometimes if I have negative self-talk and I'll say it out loud and he'll be like, Hey, be nice to angel. I like her. (laughs) And so I started thinking that to myself when I catch myself, I'm like, right. Be nice to angel. I like her. And it actually is like really helpful. So what is your biggest guilty pleasure? Well, it used to be candy, but I actually, I, yeah, I I did. I had kind of a problem and now (laughs) I'm not eating it. So 
don't, what is my did mention a Snickers right earlier. <laughs> I know. Oh man, candy. It, it had to go. <laughs> when do you feel most yourself? At music festivals. Ooh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a great like, answer. Totally. That's like when I feel like the full me is totally present. What's your favorite thing about your brain? The very uh, intelligent insults towards myself I can come up with. <laughs> Not. <laughs> Love that. Um, probably. I really like. I'm. I would say I'm equally like pragmatic and optimistic. Like I really like, I have an open mind to a lot of things and I'll hear something totally crazy and I'm not like, yeah, that's BS. But I also view things quite skeptically and I'm like willing to entertain possibilities, but then also really love like analyzing them, you know? Ooh, yeah. What is something that you're really good at that people might not know? Uh, I really love singing. Ooh. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. That's yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah. And the last one is if you had to get something tattooed on your forehead, like it's just a thing everyone is doing now. We have to get a message on our forehead that's like your billboard you walk around. What would your forehead tattoo say? Um, well, <laughs> how big can the font be or how small can it be? <laughs> However many words you want. People tend to get closer <laughs> if it's smaller. <laughs> okay. Um, well, there's three things. There Three this time. Three? Three. No, okay. no, only lot two. Just kidding. Only, I, okay, well, if I had to pick one. No, you can one, have three. <laughs> I can have three? Okay. Well, my, one of my favorite things that I think about that I just want, wish I could put on my forehead is. Because you um, could have like a forehead, a cheek, and the other cheek. Okay, okay perfect. There you go. <laughs> okay, message boards. Um, I think uh, be kind because everyone you know is fighting a great battle. I really like mm -hmm. that one. The other one is don't be so hard on yourself. Yep. And I had a third one, but my brain is only I'm sorry, allowing I me in twos. I interjected too much. <laughs> no, no, you didn't. It was that my brain's only working in twos today. <laughs> and then, of course, where can people find you on the internet? And of course, your new business and all, all yeah. the things you're up to. Well, I pretty much am only able to handle one outlet in the world right now. Apparently, it's Instagram at Angel Collinson. And anything else you want to say about mental health or things you wish people would know or hear? Well, I really appreciate that it's being talked about more these days. And I also really appreciate everyone who encourages us. Yeah, I don't know. I've just gotten so many positive interactions from opening up about just like the human struggles. And I really think that it's so interesting when you really get to know so many different kinds of people. Sometimes the people you would least expect to struggle with things are like really struggling. Yes. And so it's not like we're there's something wrong with us and everyone else has it figured out. It's like we're all living in different shades of the same experience, like fluctuating through the spectrum. And some people experience more extreme fluctuations. But like I, I just am starting to realize how challenging the human experience is and really like the more I embrace it and the more I realize that we all kind of are just coming to terms with that in our own ways like it's been super liberating well thank you so much good luck with your business I'm so excited so excited thank to follow you. it and and maybe Thanks. sign up for a 12-week thing sounds super useful I can yeah. I'll start practicing eating dinner earlier now <laughs> <laughs> totally well thank you so much for having me on thank you and thank you, wonderful human listening right now, for listening to this episode of Mentally Together. We release new episodes every Monday. So I, Cassidy Quinn, will see you next week. In the meantime, go do something nice for your brain today. Go skiing, try a meditation, do something that scares you, whatever will make your day just a little bit better. And if you're interested in learning about Ayurvedic health from Angel, she did launch her coaching business in January. Congratulations. She says the best way to get in touch with her is to DM her on Instagram. So again, you can find her there at Angel Collinson. Clearly, she is really good at talking us through all of these things about our brains and our bodies. So learning more from her sounds wonderful. Because remember, we are all just trying to keep ourselves mentally together. Together is produced, hosted, and edited by Cassidy Quinn in collaboration with Coba FM, a podcast network that is all about community, baby.